Good to see you. How are you? But he's doing pretty good. I tell you, I didn't expect you to show up. I thought I'd be the only one here on this holiday weekend, you know, you know, and everybody with turkey in your bellies and all that kind of stuff. But you're here. Are, are you? Are you kind of a little worried, okay. I think we have a couple runners. We have, we have a microphone here. We have only one, or is there another one? So if, if you have questions, if you have comments, if you have disagreements, whatever, feel free to raise your hand and we'll, uh, I'll, I'll ignore you probably, but um, no, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with it as best we can. And we're in the book of James, so hopefully you have your Bibles and you'll turn with me to the fourth chapter of James. We're about ready to finish up that fourth chapter. And um, two more weeks after this, when we'll complete all the way through, I promise, the fifth chapter of, of James. So chapter four, starting in verse 13. So while you're turning there, let me ask you, coming out of Thanksgiving, we have uh, this thing called Christmas coming up. So how many of you have all your Christmas decorations up? You've, you've completed the task. Well, there's a, a few of you, okay? How, have, have, of you that have your decorated, did you have any, anybody have them up before Thanksgiving? You have them up before, eh, kind of going there. Anybody else up over Thanksgiving? How about Halloween? <laughs> During Halloween? Okay, you're not too sick. You're just partially sick. How many are waiting till December to put them up? How many are waiting till December 24th to put them up? How many have them up since last year and you're already ahead of the, everything? <laughs> Try and check out all, all the, uh, the planners among us because we're kind of dealing with, with some, uh, some injunctions for those of us especially who like to plan, who like to, um, to have it all worked out, maybe addicted to our, our iPhone or our, our, you know, our little calendar or electronic or otherwise. So listen to what James has to say to us. Verse 13. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Now listen. I want you to, to notice two little phrases. One that comes right after, no, now listen. Now listen, you who say, you who say. And then further up in verse 15, instead, you ought to say. So he says, here's what you guys say, here's what you ought to say instead. And he starts to lay this out. Today or tomorrow you say this, today or tomorrow we're going to go do this or that. We're going to go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, make money. Now what's wrong with that statement? Sounds like a pretty good business plan, doesn't it? I mean, that's business 101. Get your, get your little group together. We're going you know, to go to Denver. We're going to go to Atlanta. We're going to be there for six months. We've got this strategy. We've got this marketing. We're going we're gonna to have profits, and we're going to make money, and then we're going to come back. Everybody loves that kind of thing. Man with a plan. You get a raise for a good marketing strategy. And then he throws this, at, but you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. So, just kind of off the cuff at the very first glance, is he, is he telling us not to plan? What's he, what's he, what's he saying to, to those who plan and strategize? What? Susie, Cheryl, Rudy, what is it? Bella. Bella. Isn't he saying that we need to include God in our plans? Or not really include God in our plans, but ensure that it's his will. Okay, so make some plans, but make sure God's, God's in them. Good. Anything else? 
So no, no problem planning. Just make sure God's in it. There's not, a, there's not a problem with planning. The problem is this, presumption. Don't be presumptuous. And he says, this is why. You don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. So it could all change. It could all be different. It could all come out of nowhere and, and boom, you're hit with something. And, and, I, and I, you know, I think about, you, I, I don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. That's a, that's a humbling thing for one thing. And it seems like all through this fourth chapter, if you'll remember, he's always opposing the proud. He doesn't, doesn't want you to be arrogant. Doesn't want, doesn't you want to be prideful. There's not, nothing more <laughs> that causes humility in us than to say, I, I don't even know what tomorrow's gonna bring. Now we who are planning like to think we know what tomorrow's gonna bring, but we really don't. So, so what do we say? So, Somebody wants to uh, have lunch with us tomorrow? Well, better not. Call me at 11.15. I could die tonight, you know. <laughs> Call me again at 11.15. There, it's it's humil- I don't. I don't know for sure. But, but there's, after, there's like a little safety in that as well, that I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know what the future holds. There's like a, a reassurance of that. If I knew what, what tomorrow was going to bring, it might be more than I could handle. Even if it was good, if I knew I was gonna be successful 10 years down the road, no matter what, I don't know that I could wait 10 years. I'd, I'd be so, or if I knew that I was gonna face some horrible trials, some loved ones were gonna die, or I was gonna experience something, it'd be, it'd be devastating. So there's, there's kind of a comfort that comes there. But as he, as he kind of lays that into that, he just says, you don't even know what's gonna happen. And by the way, what's your life anyway? You don't know what's gonna happen what is your life? Let's talk about life for a minute. The interesting thing about James is um, the genre of James keeps hearkening back to, to the Old Testament. James is the brother of, of whom? Do we remember? Jesus' brother. And you can tell he was a good Bible student. He was a good Old Testament student because he keeps going back, especially to the Proverbs and to, to a lot of the wisdom literature. So the wisdom literature was like um, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, Psalms, and that kind of thing. Um, James is kind of a, a wisdom literature of the New Testament. He, he brings in a lot of practical things, sometimes so practical it hurts. It's almost, it's almost embarrassing to sit in front of you and try to, try to teach you this because it just, and I mean, he just sticks pins in, in your heart. Oh. I'm not there, I'm not there. He's got this wisdom literature. He goes, harkens back to the wisdom literature and says, let's talk about life for a minute. And there's, a, there's an old Hebrew word that is used in the book of Ecclesiastes over and over and over again, and it's translated simply as meaningless or, or um, um, nothingness. It, it, it's, it's his vanity, it's... it's Life is vanity. Life is meaningless. It's used almost 40 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. And that word that's translated that, yeah, gives us the idea of vanity and gives us the idea of meaninglessness, but it's more than that. It's, it's what James starts to bring in, into in our forefront. It's, it's life is, is vapor. Life is, life is a mist. Life is short. Life just starts to go, and then it's gone. And Solomon, who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, the wisest man to ever live, other than Jesus when he was on this earth, the richest man, one of the richest men, one of the men that that accumulated more wealth and more power, political and financial than than anyone, more wives, perhaps, than, than anyone, and girlfriends and concubines and everything, this guy who had it all writes the book of Ecclesiastes, basically telling people, don't do what I did. If I could just sit down with some young guys, I would tell them, I've had it all and, and it's, it doesn't work. It's meaningless. And it's so short. It's like a vapor. And James picks up on that word and he starts to say, what is your life? Well, let me tell you what your life is. You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. That's kind of a downer. I'm glad I came to church tonight. Hey, 
believe me, you're a mist and you're about to vanish. And you're here for a little while. God bless you. We'll see you. Don't, don't let it wipe you out, but let it, let it turn your head a little bit. Because here's what, here's what others are saying. They're, they're planning. We're, we're going to do this. We're, we're going to this city. We're going to make money. And we're going to return. And James says, you say that, but here's the reality. You're a mist. You're here for a little while. And then you're gone. So wake up to that. Because if your life doesn't recognize that, it's going to look like what Solomon's talking about. Meaningless. Vanity. Futile. You're a mist, appears for a little while, and then vanishes. Um, I had a couple of friends that I buried this last fall. One of them younger than me, who, who had everything. Um, he, he had a great job, he had a great home, he had a great family, he was a great guy. I, I, he helped us plant a church in Scottsdale. I saw him for the first time in about 10 years at a wedding this summer. And he was working on his new thing. He was an entrepreneur, and he was working on this thing where he was so excited, not only because it was going to make him a lot of money, but it was going to do a great service. It was a, it was a system that helped, um, like a breathalyzer for drugs, so that if you're pulled over it, it would, and you were... On, on drugs of some kind, especially if you're on marijuana or whatever, it would be able to detect that. Breathalyzers can't do that. And it was going to help. He was going to start it here, and it was going to go national, and he had this whole plan, and they are going to go there and go there. And um, he would just tell me all about this and the excitement in his eyes and, 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 the, and, the, and the money, ching, 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 that he's, you know, this is going to go national. It may go internet. This is going to go. He went off to the restroom. His wife came up to me and said, hey, I see you're talking with Rick. I said, yeah, I haven't seen you guys for so long. Did he tell you about his cancer? No. I mean, he looks great. He looks like, you know, all-American guy. Now he has cancer. He doesn't tell people about it. Stage four cancer. Come on. He comes back. He starts to fill me in on his job again. I said, what? I just talked to your wife. She told me some news I couldn't believe. Ah. Ah, yeah, I'm getting treated. Doctors say, you know, not, I'm going I'm to get through this thing. I've, I've faced difficulties all my life. I'm going to get on the other side of this. I'm going I'm to do what they tell me to do. I'm going to fight it, and I've got I've a dream in life. I've got to get this thing off the ground. My daughter's getting married in December. I'm too busy. I got a call in September. And they, it was his wife, and they said they told Rick he has two weeks to live. Two weeks. Our daughter is getting married in December. We we're moving it up to this next week. Can you come help? I went over and visited him. I couldn't believe what I saw. It was emaciated. He was yellow. He was, he was dying. And he had had it all got enough strength to get his, his daughter married and that next week that next week he died I went to his house to plan the funeral and on the way I got a phone call from a lifetime friend's son who said dad's in hospice if you want to see him this is probably his last day and I went and I visited him in hospice told him goodbye watched him cry he couldn't talk all he could do is lay there and cry Went over to plan the funeral, plan the funeral with the family, got in my car and headed home. And I had two thoughts. One, cancer stinks. I would say other words, but my wife says you can't say sucks in church. So <laughs> cancer stinks. Two, life is short. I mean, I, with both these guys, one guy older than me, one guy younger than me, did both of their funerals. People at both funerals got up and said, 
I can't believe he's already gone. He's already gone. But as I was driving, a little voice in my head said, Don, you're, you're vapor. You're a mist. Listen, buddy, you're not going to live forever either. You're putting these guys in the ground. But it won't be that much longer. A snap of the eye, snap of the finger, and you're, you're going to be gone too because life goes so quick. It's so fast. Being a mist is not, is not telling us that, you know, it's not, not knocking us down. Being a, being a mist is waking us up to what life is. Lori and I, when we were celebrating our 40th anniversary, we were in Florida in this high-rise building overlooking the water. And every night, it was going to, let's go watch the sun, sunset. That was the big deal. Go watch the sunset. It was beautiful. And uh, one night it was kind of flo- foggy and cloudy and the sun was going to go down. They said, you don't want to miss the sunset. Not with the clouds and the, all, the, you know, all the different hues of color as the sun starts to set. And I said, just a minute, I'm going to take a shower. And I got to reading and, and they're yelling at me to hurry up and come watch the sunset. And I'm reading and reading and reading. And I finally go out there and they go, you missed it. What do you mean you missed it? Well, the sun went down. You missed the sun. It was the most beautiful sunset we've ever seen, and you missed it. Thanks. It was a mist. It was brilliant. It was beautiful. It was breathtaking. It was short, and it was gone. And that's a lot of our lives. And James says, you can say what you want. You can plan what you want. Go here, go there, go... You can have the world by the tail, but you don't even know what tomorrow brings. Let me tell you about life. You're a mist. You're here for a little while. Then you vanish. Instead, verse, 17, verse 15 says, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. If it's the Lord's will, will do this are any of you old enough to remember when when people would send invitations out maybe letters that at the bottom of that invitation they might say hey christmas party sunday 7 30 p.m at the bottom of that would be these little letters dv anybody remember dv nobody remembers that you're good. I, don't, I have no idea what it means. I was hoping that one of you would. <laughs> it was the word Deo Valente, God willing. We're going to have a party. You're invited, God willing. Starts at 7.30. It was almost on, on everybody's mind in those days. Long time. Back before I was very old. DV, Deo Valente. God willing, God willing, God willing, God willing. It's basically saying this, I'm going to depend on God, and I'm going to trust God. I don't know what tomorrow brings, but whatever it brings, whatever he's willing, I'm up for it. I'm there. Now, we're church people. Here on Tuesday night, gathered together with our Bibles open, I would expect you would agree with that. Yes, I don't know what tomorrow brings. Life's short. I'm dependent on God, and I trust God, and whatever God's will is for my life, I'm, I'm there. I'm good with that. I bet every one of you is shaking your heads. Yeah, I'm there. At least on Sunday. I'm there for Sunday. I compartmentalize my spiritual life. Whatever you want, God, whatever, I'm there on Sunday. But Monday through Saturday, we fall back into the pattern of I'm going to control it. I'm going to call it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to plan it. I'm going to run this thing. It's about me. It's about me. It's about me. If it's, up to, if it's going to be, it's up to me. I'm going to make this thing happen. Oh, yeah, Sunday. Oh, God, it's all yours. It's all yours. I surrender all. I surrender. Monday is back to me again. We, we have a tendency as church people to do that. We compartmentalize things. And when we do, we, we miss out on, on what James is trying to say. If, you ought to say it all the time. If, if it's your will, Lord, I'm... I'm up, I'm up with that. I'll live it. I'll do, th- I'll do it. As it is, he says in verse 16, you boast and you brag, and all such boasting is evil. Wow. You boast, you brag, 
And all such boasting is, is evil. That's kind of harsh words. Since it's kind of a downer anyway, I'm talking about funerals. <laughs> this is the most cheerful Christmas time. Let's talk about funerals. If we're not talking about yours, who could we talk about? <laughs> Do you know at a secular funeral what the number one song is? A sec, well, that might be a secular funeral. Second most popular song. Anybody want to guess? Think secular song. I did it my way. Most popular secular song, I did it my way. I loved, I laughed, I cried, I had my fill, my share of losing. And now as tears subside, I find it all so amusing to think I did all that. And may I say, not in a shy way. Oh, no. Oh, no. Not me. I did it my way. My way. I did it my way. And everybody gets all teary-eyed. Oh, that's so beautiful. He did it his way. Oh, that's so great. Isn't it wonderful? And it's all hugging and I did and James goes, are you kidding me? That's not beautiful. That's detestable. You're boasting and bragging that you've gone all through your life and you did it your way. James doesn't only say it's detestable, he says it's evil. It's sin. It's wrong. You think you are the one calling the shots of your life, and of the timeline of your life. You're missing it. You're missing it. All such boasting is evil. And then he says, anyone, verse 17, who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. That's an interesting way to kind of close that whole chapter off, isn't it? It's not, here's what you do. Because you do this, you sin. It's because you, you know what to do, but you don't do it, that it's sin. And whether you want to just look at the last paragraph or the whole book, he, he throws a lot of stuff at us. And he ends with that little statement. If, if you know to do good and you're not doing it, that's sin. That's sin. <laughs> wow. I mean, like, James, take a chill pill, buddy. You're... You really hit as well all this stuff. It, it's, it's so interesting to me, though, that Jesus wasn't far off with that, that you didn't see him going around shaming people, saying, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. But when he got on people's case was when they didn't do what they should do. Remember the Good Samaritan? The story of the Good Samaritan? And the priest and the Levite walking down, it's not like they beat the robber or beat the, the guy up that the robber had beat up. It's not like they, they added to his pain. It's not like they, they kicked him or spit on him. Or they just avoided him. They just didn't do what they knew to do. They're priests and the Levite, the religious guys of the day. Went to school to do what you're supposed to do. See somebody and walks on the side. Parable of the talents. Five talents, two talents. And then the one talent. It's not that they used the one talent poorly. It's not because he, he used the one talent and bought bad stuff or invested it. In, he, he just didn't do anything with the one talent. He buried it. He just didn't do what he needed to do with it. And James is saying, hey, it's not so much that don't do the bad stuff. It's, it's the good stuff that, that you're called to do. What's God's will? What's God calling you to do? What's God teaching you to do? And you step up on that. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, microphone, wake up. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Thanks. Two things. One, are you sure your faith in the Lord is healthy if you're a Dodger fan? Ha, 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 That's tough. That's that tough. Was, uh, and this grace will be good. Um, looking at this, when it talks about all such boasting is, is arrogant and evil, um, you know, I've been a Christian all my life, and, and my parents Christians all their lives, and, and in my family, we had years or, or months or whatever where we had a trial that nobody 
would ask for, you know, whether it was a health problem or a job reversal or something along those lines. Just, I would just be curious as to your thoughts. Part of maybe a layer of what James is saying here, and everything you've said here is very profound and true, mm -hmm. is a layer that James is saying, look, you're making plans to say, I'm gonna go have nothing but success. I, my life is gonna go great. And then I think you're probably missing out on trials that no one would necessarily ask for, but draw you closer to the Lord for going through them. I was just curious your thoughts mm -hmm. on that, maybe being a layer of this. Well, I, I don't think he's, I don't think he's, um, I don't think he's condemning success or, or good things or, or whatever. I think, I think what he's saying is whatever your plans are, if you plan without God, you're, you're going down the wrong track. So, I mean, none of us plan for, for crisis and trials and that kind of thing. Those things usually come on their own without us having to plan for them. But it's not like James saying, hey, I don't want you to make plans. I don't want you to be successful. I don't. Um, he's just saying, make sure you're including God in, into this whole, this whole picture. Um, uh, if, if, uh, if, if the trials throw you and, and kick us off the, the, the track that we're on, it's, it's recognizing that, that, God's not, um, that God's not against me or he's not punishing me because I'm, I'm chasing after good stuff. It's that we're in a broken world, and, and there's, there's bad things that happen to good people kind of thing. So, um, you know, I, th I, think that, I think the idea is presumption more than it is where that trail, that trail is going kind of thing. I've got a question for you guys. So it says, I'll do it if it's the Lord's will. If it's the Lord's will, count me in. If the, Lord's, if the Lord's in it, I'm going to live it, I'm going to do this or that. Does that sound agreeable? Yeah. Is that what it's saying? So how do you know what the Lord's will is? Trust, okay. What, I trust it, but what do I trust? What? What is the will? How do I know the will in order to trust? How do I know what God's will is for me? The Bible, okay. It's one good thing. Test it, okay, yeah. Okay, that he's leading us and guiding us, okay. Yeah. How do I know what the will is, though? I mean, I can read it. I can read it in the Bible. So some people, you know, this is the old, the old preacher story. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna find God's will for me. So they're rummaging through there, you know, and put the finger down. Oh, it says, uh, and Judas went and hung himself. Oh no, that can't. That can't. I gotta find a. Go thou and do likewise. No, 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 no. That can't. That can't be. What you do, do quickly. You know that. <laughs> how do you? How do you? How do you find God's will? How do you? Yes, ma'am. There's a you, you, microphone over there. Cinder over there. By reading and listening and doing what, doing the will of the, um, Jesus, who did the will of the Father. Okay. So following Jesus's example. Okay. All the way back in the middle there. I see it not as such as a, as a feeling or an intuition, more so than a tangible thing. Uh -huh. Because I'm um, actually this girl and I had was talking about this earlier today, and her and her this job she may come up with, and I said depending on how easy or how hard it comes. If it's God's will for it to be done, then it's going to happen. But if it's not, it's not. Or even in the sense of buying a car. So if you got to push and shove and do all of these things to make it happen, uh -huh. then that would be my sense that maybe this isn't God's will for me to have this. Okay. Okay. 
anybody out? There's right next to you. Um, seeking counsel, brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay. Good. Other, other, other people that can, can speak into your life? There's one right in the middle aisle. I don't think it just all of a sudden happens. I think it's a life process where all the little things um, that you look at and realize that all things are from God and how you respond to those. I think, I think we have a lifelong way of learning mm -hmm. what God's will is and accepting it. I don't think it just all of a sudden you wake up one day and say, oh, God's will. Yeah, yeah, good, good. Could anybody else have any ideas on the will of God? I think you have to ask, you know, who is going to get the glory for mm. it? Is it going to be me or is it going to be God? Uh. And, you know, God needs to be able to get the glory. Uh, and he will direct your paths if he is going to get the glory uh. and not myself. Yeah, yeah, good. Back to you. I have to honestly say that that's like, that's, that's the million dollar question there because it's one of those things I struggle with. Uh, every day and I sit in Bible studies and I hear you know a lot of the great things that people are saying and yet I still struggle with that uh, how do you hear God's will and I've and the times that I have like I've really heard from God I have sat and I've sat and I've talked and I've talked and it's taken forever <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. And how do you do that day yeah. in and day out I don't yeah I mean that's a hard one it's to a hard know. one yeah. What do you hear? When do you hear it? How do you hear it? Is it the right thing? Yeah. I don't know. It's I good, would love to hear your, <laughs> your take on it. Anybody else want to hear my take on it? Are you? Oh, okay, I'll, I'll give you my take. Glad you asked that question. Um, we, we, the, I, I think it's one of the biggest struggles we have as believers, discerning the will of God. And, and it comes in kind of layers. You know, so there's, there's God's will that's the sovereign will of God. That's the will of God that um, I'm not sure you're going to change it, but it's, it's God's purpose. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done here on earth. It's, it's what he wants to accomplish. But, but it's, it's more than just boom. It's not just fatalism. Some people say the will of God, you know, um, it's, it's just whatever God's going to do what he's going to do, and there's nothing I can do about it. There's nothing, you know, which Muslims do the same thing, you know, if it's the will of Allah. Or there's an old song, um, K Sarah, Sarah, remember that song? Whatever will be, will be. The future's not mine to see. It's K Sarah, Sarah. It's, it's just like, I can't do anything. It's, it's only God's sovereign will. God's sovereign will gets, gets accomplished, and, and there's not a whole lot that we can, we can do to stop it, but we can get in with it. But here's some things about God's will that, that maybe you haven't thought about before. There's the revealed God, will of God. So people, I, I want to know God's will. Well, he reveals it, like, like you said, in, in the word of God. If you have a couple minutes to look at some scriptures, 1 Thessalonians has a, a couple of them. If you want to turn over to 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, um, which is like just back left a little bit from James. You get Timothy and then 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3, it says this. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you learn to control his own body. So there's statements like that. So what's God's will for my life? Hmm, should I be sleeping with my, uh, my boyfriend or my girlfriend? No, that's, that's pretty clear. That's not God's will. Um, can I have more than one spouse no that's that's pretty clear first thessalonians 5:18 give thanks in all circumstances for this is god's will for you in christ jesus it's pretty clear should i be grumpy should i complain should i moan should i no give thanks you you know there's there's verses of scripture that come out like that that are just very clear they're they're the revealed will will of god 
Now, you have the power to, to avoid them. You have the power to, to, to um, not live them, but you don't have the right to break them. That's sin when we do that. Then there's the, there's the um, preferred will of God. Um, what's pleasing to God? And the Bible talks about some different verses of Scripture. Micah 6, 8. You know, what, what's good? What's required of you? To act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly. What pleases God? 2 Peter 3, 9. What, what's, God's, what's God's desire? That none should perish and all should be brought to repentance. Ephesians 5, 10. Um, Find out what pleases God. I, I love it in, uh, in the book of Colossians. There's a prayer that, um, that, Paul, that Paul prays, and I think it's so good to, to kind of find out what pleases God. Let me read this for you. It's, it's Colossians, the first chapter. Chapter 1, verse 9 through 11. Paul says this, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. I mean, do, do you have anybody praying for you that, that God would fill you with his will, with knowledge of his will and spiritual wisdom? And then he starts to list some of what pleases God. We pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power. What, what pleases God? What, what, what does he prefer? It's, it's, um, it, you kind of catch the glimpse of him so that as you, like, like you said, as you follow after Jesus, you start to follow after the, the will of God. Then there's a directive will of God, where sometimes in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit directs people or an angel appears and directs people. Paul one time is wanting to go into a certain area of, of Asia Minor and the Holy Spirit closes the door and closes the door and closes the door and all of a sudden there's a, this man from Macedonia that says, hey, come on over to Macedonia and they go to Macedonia and they start a whole ministry over there. Wouldn't you love some time to have a man from Macedonia telling you what the will of God is? Hey, you're, you're wrestling with this? Let me just tell you. Wouldn't you just love that? Wouldn't you just love to have it written in you know, horizon to horizon? Take a left and go right, and then, you know, that doesn't happen that often. Most times, it's, it's trying to discern the will of God in areas that aren't so clear. Who do I marry? Where do I work? Do we move? Do we have children? What do we do with our children? What about our grandchildren? What, 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 what school should I attend? What college does he want me to go to? Those are the things that start... And here, here's what's helped me with, with those kind of things, with discerning that. When it's clearly spoken out, there's no question. I, I go after it. When I'm trying to discern it, I've recognized this in my life, that it's, that it's a process to find God's will as much as it is the destination of finding God's will. That it's, 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 a, it's a walk with him. It's a journey with him. That sometimes that, that desire to, to find that, what God's calling me to do, is more about a relationship that you'll trust and you'll walk with him on. So that usually when it comes to the will of God, we want a, a, a process. A plus B plus C plus E equals the will of God. And it's not that easy. And it might be a whole lifetime. It might be, it might be 30 years, it might be 40 years. In the, in the Bible, there, there's people that wait on God and wait on God and wait on God a lifetime trying to find exactly what his will is, but it draws them to him. Enoch in the Bible, in the Old Testament, was a man known for walking with God so that when he died, people would, would talk about him as the one who walked with God. I don't, know, I don't know anything else about God's will, but I know this. If at the end of my life somebody would look at me and say, Don walked with God, he walked with God. I would, I would look at that as a life that's lived with the will of God, that that walking and that journey, because otherwise it becomes self-centric, self-centric completely. I want to find God's purpose for me, and God's saying, I want you to do my purposes. I want you to find my purpose. Walk with me. Let's go together. Then let's find this thing. So it's a process of walking. It's not just a, 
a statement or a solution. Um, also, it's, it's surrendering our will to God. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I, I beseech you to, to make yourself a living sacrifice, brothers and sisters. Not just a dead sacrifice, a living sacrifice. Get on the altar and give your whole self to me. The problem with living sacrifices, the old preacher once said, is they, they kind of crawl off the altar before uh, it gets too hot. Living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to me. And by the renewing of your mind, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by that renewing. And you will then know the good, perfect, pleasing will of God. It's a surrender. Lord, I'm telling you before I know, I'm signing on the dotted line. I don't know what the card says. All I'm telling you is I'm signing on the line. I surrender all. I'm going to let you renew my mind. I'm going to learn. I'm going to, I'm going to do what spiritual disciplines I need. I'm going to do what Bible study I need, what prayer I need, what learning I need to do, whatever I need to do to re re renew my mind because this world's trying to conform me into this little box. I don't want to think like the world. I don't want to plan like the world. I want to be different than the world. And I'm signing up right now just ahead of time. Lord, you can trust me with your will. And I surrender to it. And then we obey what we already know. When he does tell us something, we obey it. It may not be the whole thing listed out, but we obey what we know. If you expect God to, to reveal his will to you, what do you know about his will? If you can go through some of the principles that are in here, the precepts of what his will is about, and you're not living them, why is he going to trust you with more of his will? Or if he knows good and well that you're not going to go for it, why? What do you know about his will? Well, I know, I know he wants me to be saved. Okay. I, want, I know he wants me to be baptized. Have you been baptized? Well, no, I'm thinking about it. Well, why would he, why would he want to reveal anything else to you? Back in the, in the book of um, Jeremiah, I think it is, verse 40, or chapter 42, there's an interesting occasion where they're going into, into the exile in Babylon, and the, the people go to Jeremiah, the prophet, and they say, we, we can't take it anymore. We're getting wiped out here in exile. We want to go back to Egypt. But would you pray and ask God what we're supposed to do? Because we, we want to get out of here. We want to go back. And Jeremiah says, I'll, I'll pray, but you've got to promise to do what he tells us to do, what he tells you to do. They say, we're, we're with you. All right, no problem. Whatever he says, we'll do. So Jeremiah prays like 10 days, and he comes back to him, and he says, okay, I've got an answer. God says, you stay in Babylon, and he's going to bless you. He's going to make the king have favor on you. There's not going to be any more danger. He's going to restore all the things you've lost. It's going to be the greatest thing in the world. But if you go back to Egypt, he said, it's going to turn all bad. Do you know what the people did? They went back to Egypt. Stupid people. And then I look at my own life. God, give me your will, give me your will, give me your will. Anything you tell me, do it. He tells me, and I do what I want to do anyway. And I wonder why it didn't work out right. When we know what he's telling us to do, to do it. And then like you, what you all have mentioned, seek godly input. Others are, others are going to help you with that. Listen to God's spirit as he speaks. I don't know that there's going to be an angel standing at your bedpost or the man from Macedonia kind of thing, but I think God prompts us and whispers to us. Here's what I've learned in my prayer life to do more of. Shut up. <laughs> just be quiet and listen Jesus said the sheep hear the voice of the shepherd they know his voice and they follow him and I'm usually too busy and too noisy and too much about my own self and they just shut up and listen and so what I found to do at times is just get a sheet of paper be quiet before the Lord and say, Lord, you speak. I don't know any better than I'm going to write down whatever starts coming to my mind. And I'm going to see what you're trying to tell me. And through the years, I've learned to discern his voice more than I have my own even. I know the difference. And I start to write down, Lord, speak. Lord, prompt. Close doors, open doors. Use my gifts. Use my, use my giftings. Use my desires, use what I have 
use my abilities, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a list, I'm going to look for circumstances, and I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait on you. And that's where it all falls apart because none of us like to wait. We want it now. I want your will. I want it now. And I want it to be successful. And he says, I'll give you my will. It's to walk with me. And there's no guarantees. But I'll tell you, if you'll do that, you're in for a journey. Because you're going to live by faith. And the Bible says it's impossible to please God apart from faith. So if you want God's will, and he takes you to the edge where it's going to, you're going to have to take all that you have to step out in faith. Would you do it? Or would you go back to Egypt where it looks safer and you know? And I'd rather have the problems that I know than the promise that seems so threatening in front of me. So I, I, I've, uh, I've in my own life, as I've wrestled with the will of God, I've learned to trust the voice of God. I've learned to trust the voice of my wife. And, um, and then I've learned to, to go back and trust her voice again. <laughs> because I've usually avoided it to begin with. And then I, I recognized that that will may not be just a little dot. It may be a circle that he calls me into that, that he says, hey, I love you, Don. I trust you in that circle. It may not be that one little point you got to find, but it's in this big circle that I, of my grace that I, that I call you into. And he loves sometimes just to give us the desires of our heart. And in the process of that, it's a faith walk. In the, in the will. The wrestling of the will with the will is sometimes even more important than finding that actual will because we draw closer to God. Are you still awake? Any comments? Questions? Well, I'm, I'm struggling with that right now, right? I've got a, uh, I've got a life changing opportunity. Uh -huh. <laughs> Amen. 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 Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Will you let us know? Will you let us know when you know? <laughs> that's great. Thank you for sharing that. That's, that's, that. I mean, life is full of that. And you know, here's what I, what I think. So often with the will of God, we, we make it so much about us. And here's what I know about the will of God. He, he's got a purpose for us, but it, his purpose for us is in his overarching purpose. And his overarching purpose is to conform us into the image of his son and for us to be able to do the works of his son so that this world gets the light of, of, of believers that are, that are acting like, like Jesus. So, you know, he may take you to it you know, Washington, D.C. to do that. He may take you across. He may leave you right where you're at. But in all that process, I think the thing to continue to ask, God, what are, you, what are you doing in me through this? What are you doing in us, your husband, your husband and wife team? How do we become more like Jesus through this? How is he conforming us? What's he knocking off in us 
and on us that, that needs to be knocked off in this, in this whole process. Sometimes he has to knock a bunch of stuff off on us, and then he just leaves us where we're at to begin with. But he, just, he had to knock that out to, to make us more like Jesus. In order that, we can do the works of Jesus and that we can accomplish the purposes of Jesus. And people will start to look at us, and when they see us, like out of this chapter, they see us that we've made Christ first and that we are doing his will first. And there's not a lot of people in this world that have put Christ first and his will first. And when we do that, when we, when we center on, on him and we hook all our plans on him, it's like a bicycle spoke or spokes. We have all these plans that come out, but they're, they're hooked onto this wheel, which is the center of Christ. And, and the Bible tells us when, when Jesus is the center, when we seek him first, all these things will be added. All these things are added. If we're planning all these things and they're not, they're not connected to Jesus, we don't know where they go, but they're connected to Jesus. Your, your bike will go somewhere. You will get there connected to him. And, um, and that's, great. that's a great way to trust him and, and love him. So thank you for sharing that. Anybody else? We'll pick up next time in, in chapter 5. Um, I'm going to let you out a little bit early. Happy Thanksgiving and Christmas. I tell you, don't get any better. Let's pray, and then Diane will come and dismiss us. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we recognize that these words of, of James are so practical. They're right where the rubber meets the road. And, and as practical as they are, they're, they're, they're so... Uh, they're, they're so direct in our lives that they don't allow us to stay the same. They keep pushing us forward to be more like you, to trust more, to live more, to grow more. And Lord, I thank you for the way we wrestle with our plans and with your will. And I thank you that through this, you won't let us go. You'll make us more and more like Jesus. We'll make us more, we'll make us more like your children. And Cornerstone will be known for a group of people who have put you first, both in, in faith and in plans. And we thank you in Jesus' name.